All right, so we just saw that we have two different types of bonds. All right, so it be ionic bond and covalent bond. So ionic bond is when the ions come together, right? So Na plus, Cl minus. When you have ions coming together, that's an ionic bond, right? And when you have the sharing, right? So if a hardened shares one electron, this hardened shares one electron, when they share both one electron each, that bond is covalent bond. So when they share electrons and when the negative parts they come together, right? <clears throat> so two different. Now, covalent bond can also be further divided into two categories. Okay, so covalent bond can be further divided into two categories, and that is sigma and pi bond. So sigma bond and pi bond. Okay, so sigma and pi. <clears throat> All right. So the question is, how do I find out which is a sigma bond and which is a pi bond? Right. So let's say we have a carbon-carbon bond. So we have three categories. Right. So carbon-carbon single bond. Then we have a carbon-carbon double bond, and we have a carbon-carbon triple bond. So if you compare this, then how do you find our sigma bond? So first bond, it is always sigma, right? So the first bond here, so that's how so you have a, this is a sigma bond. So first bond is sigma and all the multiple bonds, when you have more than one, that's gonna be a pi bond, okay? So first bond is sigma, right? So this is your sigma bond. And then all the multiples are pi bonds. So here you have a pi bond. Okay, so first is sigma, all the multiples are pi. All right. <clears throat> so in this case, how do you figure out then? The first bond is sigma. So this is sigma bond. And then you have two pi bonds. So these two are the pi bonds. So you have pi bonds. <clears throat> So here we have one sigma, two pi, one sigma, one pi, and only sigma. All right, that's how you figure out how many sigma and pi bonds we have. Again, they are formed by the sharing electrons. So that's so they are covalent bond, but they can be further divided into sigma and pi. Okay, so first bond is sigma, all the multiples are pi bonds. All right. All right. So molecular geometry. So geometry basically is what the shape of the molecule, right? So carbon now can have three different types, right? So carbon can have all the single bonds. Carbon can have a double bond and carbon can have a triple bond, right? So these are the different forms of carbon you can see, right? A single bonded, carbon double bonded or triple bonded, right? So in this case, if you look at the shape, right? Right, so we have, let's say this is A is a central atom, right? So this is your AB4 model, right? So A and B4, okay? So if you have AB4 model, then the shape is tetrahedral. Okay, so that has a tetrahedral shape, and the bond angle here is 109.5. 109.5 degree bond angle. That's your AB4 model, all right? <clears throat> so this is AB3, so if this is your carbon in your central atom, then there are three groups attached to it, right? So A, B, and C, right? So that will be AB3 model. So A is the central atom. So A is the central, and three are the small cell atom to it, right? So you have AB3 model, and that will be trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. In this case, this is your central atom, carbon, and that has two around it, so that's your AB2 model. And AB2 model is linear. It's just, a, just one line, right? So here the bond angle is 120 degree. Right? So if you look at the bond angle right here, this bond angle is 120 degree. And here the bond angle is 180 degree because this is linear. So what the shape of 
the molecule, when you have all the single bonds, okay, that is tetrahedral or AB4 model. Look at the model. It's AB4 or carbon with all the single bonds. And carbon with a double bond or AB3 model, whichever you look, that is trigonal planar and the bonding is 120 degrees. And AB2, when carbon has two atoms around it, that is linear, and there's a straight line, so one angle here is 180 degrees. So we are looking at these one angles. Right? So we have three different types of carbons, right? a single bonded, double bonded, and triple bonded carbon. Right? So next part is hybridization. Okay. So the meaning of hybridization basically is when you're forming a bonds, what kind of orbitals are involved in forming a bond? Right? So when you have the carbon is forming a bond with four hydrogens here, what orbitals are playing the role? It's S orbital, P orbital, okay, like that. So in this case, we have three different types of carbons again. So carbon with all the single bonds, carbon with a double bond, and carbon with a triple bond. So hybridization for those is single bonded carbon is always SP3. So 1S and 3P coming together to form these bonds. So this is SP3. Our double bonded carbon is sp2 and our triple bonded carbon is sp. So the best way to keep in mind, or if you want to remember this, the best way is look at the carbon okay, and see that it has a single bond, double bond or a triple bond. Right? So if it has all the single bonds that is sp3, it has a double bond is sp2 and a triple bond is SP. So there are three different types of hybridizations for carbon, SP3, SP2, and SP. So next concept is electronegativity. Right, so what is electronegativity first of all? Right? So electronegativity is ability of an atom to pull the electrons toward itself. Okay, so let's say if you have a carbon and a chlorine bond, okay? So carbon and chlorine, right? So chlorine is more electronegative compared to carbon. So chlorine is more electronegative. So this is pulling the electron pair. So when the electrons are in the bond, so these electrons are pulled more towards the chlorine. That's how we show with the vector that the flow of electron is more towards chlorine. And that is making them because that's why because the chlorine is more electronegative. So how do you find out which is more electronegative here? You have to look at the periodic table for that. Okay. So electronegativity increases left to right and bottom to top. So electronegativity increases bottom to right and so all the roads go to fluorine. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. So fluorine is the highest electronegativity. So left to right and bottom to top, electronegativity increases in the periodic table, okay? Now we know which is more electronegative, it's carbon or chlorine. So carbon is on the left side and chlorine on the right hand side. So chlorine is more electronegative. That means it's pulling the electron pair. So we've got the electrons again in the bond. So these electrons are pulled more towards chlorine. And that's how we show it. So when chlorine gets more electron, that will get the partial negative charge. And carbon is losing, this electron pair is more shifted towards chlorine, so this will get the delta plus charge, again. And when you have a situation like this, we create two poles, negative pole and positive pole, and this is called the dipole. So due to electronegativity difference here, Chlorine is more electronegative, okay? So it's pulling the electrons. So chlorine should have a partial negative charge and carbon should get the partial positive charge. And in this position, okay, because that situation we call it as dipole. So we create a dipole in this case, okay? And the flow of electron we show by a vector like this. So the pull of electron is towards chlorine, okay? <clears throat> And we also call this as a pole. So when you have a dipole, we also call it as a polar bond. 
Okay, so that's that's the importance of electronegativity. That when you have <clears throat> the electrons being pulled on one side, that will create a dipole, and that will make the bond polar. So we'll have the positive and negative. That makes a bond polar. So that's a polar bond. <clears throat> so what are the polar bonds? And you can have a carbon fluorine bond is a polar bond. You get a difference in electronegativity. Right. So that's your polar bond. Okay. What about carbon carbon bond? Is carbon carbon bond polar or non polar? So that's your polar bond. So they have equal electronegativity. There's no difference. So that's why this is non polar. Okay, and same is true for carbon hydrogen bond. So we have a carbon hydrogen bond. That bond is non polar because there's no difference in electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen. So it's also non polar. So polar bond, non polar bond. All right. <clears throat> so what is bonded to itself, okay, let's say you have an oxygen oxygen bond or nitrogen nitrogen bond, that will already be non polar. But if you have a carbon nitrogen bond, right, so carbon nitrogen bond. Should be a polar bond. Carbon oxygen bond is a polar bond. This is polar and this is polar. Okay. So again, if you want to find out it is a polar or non-polar bond, then you just have to look at the periodic table and find out which is more electronegative. Okay, out of those two. Okay, if one is more electronegative compared to other one, then you should have the dipole and that we call as a polar bond. In this case, carbon carbon, okay, they're equally that they're, they're equal, so that's why there should not be any <clears throat> there should not be any dipole, and that's why that is non-polar bond. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we know which is a polar bond, which is a non-polar bond. Now we can find out which is a polar and non-polar molecule. Okay, so we're looking at the whole picture now. Okay, the entire molecule, not just one bond. All right. So let's say you have a bond like this. Right? So you have a molecule which is methane. Right? And you want to find out is this a polar or non-polar molecule? Right? So the condition number one first, you should have at least one polar bond. So you should have at least one polar bond. To be polar. So do we have any polar bond here? Carbon hydrogen bond is not polar, right? So that means this whole molecule is non-polar because there's no polar bond here. All right. Just take another example here. So if you have a carbon, and what I will do is I will replace one of the hydrogen with a chlorine. Right. So if I replace a carbon hydrogen with a chlorine, right? Now do we have at least one polar bond here. Right? So yes, the carbon chlorine bond is a polar bond and the electron pool is toward this side. Right? So the force is this way. Right? Now, do, is it, so we, we have the condition here, at least one polar bond, but if this molecule polar or non-polar, how do you find out? Okay. So the best example here is, look at the, let's say, imagine a situation that there's a truck stuck in the mud. Okay, and you have to pull the truck out of the mud. All right. So can we get the truck out of the mud here? Right. So all the force is going in one direction. Right? So force is going in one direction. So if you apply the force in one direction, you can get the truck out of the mud. Right. So if you can, yeah, then that is polar. Okay. That is the polar molecule, not polar bond now, we're looking at the whole molecule. So that is a polar molecule. That is a polar molecule. All right. <clears throat> Let's take another example. I'm just gonna go ahead and modify this example here. So we have some carbon with chlorine on each side now. All right. <clears throat> So do we have at least one polar bond here? Yes, we have polar bonds, which is carbon-chlorine bond is polar. 
So there's also one polar bond here, there's one polar bond here, and there's one polar bond. Here. All right. So we have four polar bonds. Now, is this molecule polar or non-polar? How do you figure it out? You have to apply the same logic here that can we get the truck out of the mud? Right? So all these forces are going in four different directions. All right, so can we get the truck out of the mud here? No. So that means this is non-polar. Okay. In other words, all these forces are going in all, all different directions. So that effect is zero. Okay, they will cancel each other. That's why this is non-polar. Right. <clears throat> All right, let's take another example here. So we have water. Okay. So when you write a water molecule, always write a band. Okay, because that's the shape of the water molecule according to the VSCPR theory. Than the shape of the water molecule, <clears throat> right? So in this case, do we have a polar bond? Yes, hydrogen oxygen bond is polar, and oxygen is more electronegative, so it's pulling this way and it's pulling this way, right? So the force is going in one direction. So the net force here is this, and that's why if you think, can we get the drop out of the mud here? Yes. So this is polar. And we know that water is polar anyways. All right, <clears throat> All right so polar and non-polar molecules. So make sure you apply the logic of getting the truck out of the mud. And that was pretty good with this. All right, again, don't forget, okay, to show the, the flow of electron, okay, with the shift of electron, which is a vector. All right? So which is polar and non-polar, all right? <clears throat> So intermolecular forces, okay, so what are intermolecular forces? The forces holding the two molecules together, okay, or the forces between the two molecules, that is intermolecular forces, right? <clears throat> so what kind of different forces we have? You probably have some idea about this, okay? So we have three different types of forces. We have Van der Waals forces. So we have Van der Waals forces, right? Then we have dipole dipole. And rations. And then the third one is hydrogen bonding. All right. <clears throat> so we have van der Waal forces. So van der Waal forces, van der Waal forces are present any, everywhere, pretty much, whatever there is electron, okay, there'll be Van der Waal forces, right? So you can just make it a general statement that there's a molecule, there will be Van der Waal forces, all right? So what are dipole dipole then? Okay, so dipole dipole, okay, it, it reminds you something about the polar molecule, right, or polar bond. So when you have the dipole, basically it comes from the polar bond, right? So let's say if you have an example like this, if you have, carbon oxygen bond, okay, and other carbon oxygen bond. Okay, remember this is between the two molecules, right? So if you have a carbon oxygen, let's say if you have something attached to here, right? So carbon and oxygen, which is more polar oxygen, so that should have the delta negative charge, and this should have the delta positive charge. So delta positive for this and delta negative. All right, so that's how we know that carbon oxygen bond is a polar bond because oxygen is more electronegative, right? So negative positive atoms, they will attract each other. Okay, negative positive, they will attract. And that force here is called as a dipole-dipole interaction because here we create the dipole and then they will attract each other. So interaction between the two dipoles, so that is your dipole-dipole interaction. Again, every time is negative going towards positive. Okay, so negative going towards positive. Okay, that's interaction is dipole dipole. And what is hardened bonding? Hardened bonding is very specific. Hardened bonding can only happen 
but you have OS bond, okay, and S bond or HF bond. So only if occurs when you have these three. Let's say you have water, right? So you have water H2O. So which is more electronegative here? So you have two water molecules the same. So oxygen is more electronegative, so that should be delta negative, and this will be delta positive. All right, the same is true here. There will be delta negative and delta positive. And when you have delta negative and positive, they will attract. Those atoms will attract. Okay. And it's happening through hydrogen, and that's why we call it as a hydrogen bonding. Okay. So hydrogen bonding doesn't happen every time. Okay. You need to have these three conditions for hydrogen bonding. All right. All right. So we have three different types of forces. Right. So we have van der Waals forces, dipole dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding. Okay. So now we're trying to get into which forces are stronger. Right. So the van der Waals force, dipole dipole hydrogen bonding. So the trend goes left to right. So left to right, strength of the forces increases. Strength increases. I guess the hardened bonding is the strongest. And the matter will be the weakest forces. And why is important? It will also tell you the physical properties of a molecule, such as boiling point, melting point. So the strength of the forces increases boiling point, melting point also increases. So this way, you have boiling point or melting point that increases this way. Okay, from left to right. The same way, strength of the force increases, melting point, boiling point also increases. All right, so let's take a real example and find out which one has the highest boiling point or melting point, right? And how do you find out? Okay. We first look at the inner molecular forces. So what kind of forces we have, right? So this is only carbon-carbon bond and carbon-hydrogen bond, okay? So in this case, we have only, there's no polar bond here, so that's the only forces we have is van der Waals forces. So we only have van der Waals forces in this case, right? So here also we all have van der Waals forces. Every molecule will have van der Waals forces, no matter what it is, okay? So everyone has van der Waals forces, okay? What else we have here? We have a carbon oxygen bond, which is a polar bond. So when you have the polar bond, that means you have a dipole, so there should be a dipole-dipole interaction. So we have dipole-dipole interaction, all right? And we also have the same here. We have hydrogen and oxygen, which is a polar bond. So we also have dipole dipole interaction. Okay. What we also have here is the OH bond. So if you have an OH bond, then you have the hydrogen bonding. So we also have the hydrogen bonding. Okay. So strength of the forces increases. Okay. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest force. The strongest means it will have the highest boiling point. So the boiling point increases left to right. So boiling point increases. From left to right. All right. So this will be the lowest, and this will be the highest. All right. All right. So let's compare these examples and we find out which one has the higher boiling point. Right. So the first thing always is to find out what kind of inner molecular forces we have. Right. So this should have van der Waals forces. Right. So we have a carbon, carbon, and a carbon hydrogen. That's all we have. And here we have a carbon, carbon, and a carbon hydrogen. Okay. So that's all we have. So this should have only van der Waals forces. So the problem here now is. This has van der Waals forces, and this also has van der Waals forces. Okay. 
So how do we decide which one will have the higher boiling point? Okay. So in this case, when they have the same amount of forces or the same forces, then we look at the molecule. So when it's a chain, when the straight chain molecule, then it has a larger surface area. So larger the surface area, okay? So when it's a straight molecule, that has a larger surface area. And when it's a larger surface area, that should have the higher volume. Right. Our other way to look at is look at the branches. So this is your chain, and then you have branches. So when you add more branches, okay, you basically reduce the surface area. Surface area goes down, and that's why this will be the plus. So more branches. Then you have less surface area. Okay, so that should have the lower boiling point. So lower boiling point. All right, so higher boiling point and lower boiling point. Again, look at the square chain. If it's a chain, it has a higher surface area. And if it has branches, then it has low. But then they have the same number of carbons, right? So if you compare, you have carbon one, two, three, and four. And they have one, two, three, and four. So they have the same number of carbons and hydrogens. Okay, so the only difference here is it's a chain and this has branches. All right, so compare, we only have two ways to look at. Okay, first of all, if you can find out different forces, right? So if you have random wall forces or dipole dipole, then there's an easy way out of that. And if not, then look at the branches. All right, so two different ways to find out. All right, so just one last thing from chapter one is we have four different atoms to look at. So we usually talk about carbon, we usually talk about nitrogen, oxygen, and halogens. All right, so halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. All right, so we're going left to right in the periodic table. Right? So carbon should have always four bonds. Okay. Nitrogen should always have three bonds. Oxygen has two bonds and halogen has one bond. So there's a trend. Okay, the trend is four, three, two, and one. Okay. So number of bonds goes down from left to right. And carbon has four and halogen has one bond. Okay. But each atom, right? So it's not carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and halogen. They should have eight electrons. Remember the octet rule? All right, so each atom must have eight electrons around them. Okay, so carbon has how many electrons here? So we have two plus two plus two plus two. I mean, each bond means four electrons. So carbon has one, two, three, four. Four bonds, that means eight electrons. All right. So here, how many electrons we have around nitrogen? Okay, so we have two plus two plus two, six. Okay, but we want eight because of the octet rule, and that's why we put a lone pair of electrons. Okay, so when you write nitrogen, always put a lone pair on the nitrogen. If it has three bonds, one, two, and four. Okay, why we need that to complete the octet? All right. Oxygen has two bonds, that means you only have four electrons, then you should put the two electron pairs. So that will make it two plus two, four, and four plus four, eight. So two plus two plus two, six, plus two, eight. So you have to match total eight, right? So how does it should have how many electron pairs then? It should have three electron pairs. All right, so you keep in mind, the way you want it. So we have four bonds, three bonds, two bonds, and one bond. And then one electron pair, two electron pairs, and three electron pairs. Okay? So make sure you keep this in mind because you're going to need it all the time. Okay? 
very, very important concept because it's very easy to forget that nitrogen has electron pair or oxygen has two electron pairs. Okay. But we're gonna need them later on. Okay. So don't forget why is, why we need two electron pairs here, why we need one here, why we need three? Because of the octet rule. Okay, we need to match the eight electrons. Okay, and we also saw how to write Lewis dot structures, right? So we kind of knew ahead of time that electron pair there has to be one electron pair on the nitrogen and oxygen and halogen. All right. So that completes chapter one. Um, <clears throat> I will post more videos about chapter two and three.